first of all, I'd like to thank you, Robert, for being a WADA member and um, supporting our goals to provide our members the benefits of free education classes. And thank you everyone for joining us today for Waves and Water. My name is Susan Antoinette and I am um, a WADA Education Committee co-chair along with Anna Brochures, who's also in our Zoom meeting here. And on behalf of our entire committee, we would like to present you with this live three-part complimentary online class. The focus of this series will be on painting the main characteristics of water. WADA and St. Pete's own Robert J. Simone will share his expertise on this in intimidating subject. So participants will learn the future of um, anatomy of waves as well as how to convey movement and translucency. Robert will explain in detail his three-step process for moving from block in to development to finish. Um, a little, little background on Robert, which I'm sure he'll share some as other things as well, but he is a nationally recognized, he is nationally recognized as an award-winning artist. His landscape, seascape painting, work, painting workshops are highly regarded. He is a signature member of the Artist Society of Marine Arts, or the American Society of Marine Arts, artists, and of the Outdoor Painters Society. Robert is also an exhibiting artist member of the prestigious Salamangi Club in New York City. Uh, so some logistics here. Um, in addition to tonight's, uh, in, in addition to tonight, uh, this class will meet Wednesday, the evening of July 15th and July 22nd um, from 6 to about 7.30. Um, since we kind of get a little bit of a later start, it might go a little beyond that, but we'll, we'll see how tonight goes. Uh, this class is suitable for all levels, working primarily in oils, water-based oils, open acrylics and acrylics. Uh, and then here's the part in the chat that I'd like to just remind you one more time. If you could please put in your chat your full name, your, your email address, and then yes or no if you are a WADA member. That would be very helpful for, for, for us. Okay, so let's get started. So I present to you Robert Simone. Welcome everybody. It's great to be here. Um, super happy to see everybody's smiling faces and always happy to share my passion with you and um, I think this is going to be a little bit different experience than you may have had. Some of you I know have been um, attending some virtual classes, online classes, and I've structured this one a little bit differently. So rather than being a paint along and so forth, what I did is I pre-recorded some painting sessions. I painted one painting start to finish and I broke it into three sessions. And I think that's gonna become evident as we start to look at some of the material that I have to present to you tonight. Um, I wanna let you know that this meeting is being recorded. And one of the reasons that we had you register so we could get an email is so that we can email you the link to that recording. Because if you're up for it, you're gonna have some homework. You can watch this again at your leisure and you'll be able to, to paint a, a little, I hate to use the homework assignment because you might click back into junior high and freeze up and not want to do your homework. But um, anyway, uh, this class is um, going to be, let me just go ahead and, and I'm going to share a screen with you and we're just going to dive right in to what I have to offer. Okay, so what you're looking at there, the first thing I have to show you are just a few paintings that I've done over the years of, of just basic waves. And the idea is to let you know that just one simple wave can be a pretty exciting painting. This, this is a large painting. Um, if I remember right, it's like 25 by 45. And it was done for a couple up in Seacliff, New York, which is uh, on Long, High, Long Island. Um, and this is also a, uh, a scene painted from 
photo references. This is was up in Montauk, as where I took the references for this scene. And it's a larger painting, 22 by 28. This is um, it's an interesting painting where it's a I took three or four different photos of different waves and I combined them to design one big wave. And this one is 24 by 36. And I think some of you may remember this was a demo that I did for my class, uh, local painting class at Suntan um, a couple of years ago. And this is the painting that I'm going to paint during uh, this class. And we're going to watch uh, the, the block in, the development, and the finish of this painting. And what we have here is the anatomy of a wave. So I'm just going to use my cursor and hopefully you can follow along. I know this is a real close up of a really giant wave, but what we have here is the top of a wave as it's breaking. So this is the wall or sometimes called the face. And this surfer should give you a little bit of an idea. He's inside the barrel and everybody's probably seen uh, a surfer coming out of the barrel on a wave. So that'll give you a little bit of perspective of what we're looking at. And the uh, reason some of this is important is because this is um, going to help you figure out what it is you're supposed to be painting and doing. So uh, we have the hook where that wave curls over, then we have the lip and the rest of the curl. And I call this the splash down. This diagram's calling it the over the falls. Um, and out in front, you have a little bit of a trough that's the flat line plane out in front of a wave. And then there's the whitewash, which is that soup out in, out in front of that. So let me back up and I'll just show you some of that same anatomy. So if we look at this painting. This is the uh, wave face or the wall. The top of it there is the crest. And then you have the hook and it spills over and you have the curl. Inside there is the barrel, splash down zone right here. One thing that wasn't really visible in that diagram is um, this area called the tube. So where it rolls over, you're looking at the outside of the barrel, that's called the tube. And then out in front, we have the trough and there's some soup out in front and um, then, of course, you have your background water and, and some sky. And I think I talk about the relationship between the background water and your wave in the demo. So if not, I'll, I'll point out some more uh, important pieces of anatomy there. So um, this is a profile view of looking at some breaking waves. And basically what happens is... Um, you have these energy orbs where the water is rotating and as those energy orbs start to make contact with the bottom as we get closer to the shore the wave starts to steepen and then it starts to break the reason i wanted to show this one is because from a profile view the thickness of the water is much thinner up at the top here than it is down at the bottom. And that's gonna play into the value structure of our paintings as we move forward. So that's, that's something to keep in mind. And this is just um, a profile view of how waves, um, sort of the profile of waves, how they behave depending on the steepness of the beach. Um, here in uh, where we live in St. Pete, it's mostly a nearly horizontal beach. So we get these spilling breakers that'll have a lot of foam out front. And um, as the beach gets steeper, the waves really take, they form more nicely and really start to form a curl. If it's a super, very steep beach, it, they don't even really curl. They just keep coming forward and slam into the, the wave. So that's just stuff that if you really get into painting waves, you're going to end up thinking about that with the different um, reference materials that you're using and helping you figure things out. So now what you're looking at here 
is the original reference that I used for the painting for this workshop. And I want to show you just a couple of things about it. Um, this horizon line, see how it's, it's not straight, it's tilted. You never want to paint your horizon line the way it appears on the camera. Sometimes we don't know we're tilting the camera and you're always going to have a level horizon line. And then, um, you know, I felt like the relative size of space in front of the wave and behind the wave were very even. So I did a little photo manipulation to come up to turn this particular photo into a better reference. And oops, sorry, I hit my button twice. So here's what I ended up with. You can see that I straightened out the horizon and I cropped the photo such that I have more foreground and less background. And I gave myself, did I mention that I also flipped it? Uh, so I flipped the photo horizontally to change the orientation of the wave. So to give you another look back at that. Oops, I keep hitting my buttons more than once. So it's real helpful and it takes some time sometimes if you're not familiar with some of the, the photo editing software that's available to you. Um, but if you, you spend some time learning that, you can turn a, a somewhat mediocre reference into something that's a whole lot better than what you had before. So um, I think what I wanna do um, is I'm gonna go next into a video next, which is just an explanation of my materials. And then I'm gonna pause the screen share and we'll have a little time for some Q&A before moving forward. Okay, just a quick overview of my palette, my colors and my tools. The palette that you're looking at is a clear piece of glass laid down over the top of my tabaret which has been painted gray. So that gives me a nice neutral background that helps me judge colors and values as I'm mixing paint on the palette. Then a quick uh, bird's eye view of the palette reveals that I have my cool colors, then I have my white, then I have my warms, and then I have my earth tones. So I arrange the colors in that same pattern and in the exact same order, every painting, painting in and painting out. That way I am never caught hunting and pecking for where did I put my Viridian today? It's always in this spot. So um, it just makes the whole painting and mixing process more instinctive and, and more fluid. So that, you know, it just, uh, I'm not getting interrupted with, with hunting and pecking for where I may have put a given color. Then these are, these are also the same colors that I use for every single painting. I, I'm not changing colors from painting to painting to painting. I'm using the same colors. I've gotten to know the, the wide range of mixtures that I can make with all these colors, and it's more than enough that I need. In fact, if I were to change the palette, I would just put less colors out there. Um, so it's just I, I really strongly recommend that you settle on um, a certain arrangement of colors and use those same colors every painting, painting in and painting out and you'll just find your paintings getting more and more colorful. So I use two basic brands of paint. I use Williamsburg and Windsor Newton. And I'm just gonna fly down the, the colors that I have on the palette real quick. Um, basically I've got white and black. I've got two of each primary and one of each secondary color and I have three earth tones. So I have Windsor Newton Ivory Black and I have Provence Violet Bluish by Williamsburg. Then I have Ultramarine and I have Prussian Blue and I have Viridian. I have two piles of white and I'll tell you why there's two piles of white in just a moment. Then I have Alizarin Crimson and I have Scarlet Cadmium. That's a Windsor Newton color, but it's really just cad red light. It's the exact same pigment that other manufacturers will label as 
CAD red light. Winsor Newton just calls it scarlet cadmium. Then the next color that I have is a secondary color. It's called alizarin orange. This is a Williamsburg color. And I'll just tell you, this color is like sunlight in a tube. That Just a small touch of that color added to your white will turn the brightest, cleanest, richest, most beautiful yellow. It looks exactly like sun sunlight. So that's a fantastic color to have on the palette. Then I have two yellows. I have Cad Yellow Medium and I have Cad Lemon. And then I have um, my earth colors, which are Raw Umber, Burnt Sienna, and Yellow Ochre Pale. I use Yellow Ochre Pale rather than regular yellow ochre because it's just a little softer. It's not as harsh as standard yellow ochre and a little more benign in the mixtures. Just suits my aesthetic and sensibility a lot better. And I think an interesting thing to note about my earth colors is they're arranged in order of value. I have a dark, a medium, and a lighter one. Okay, so back to the two piles of white. I. This pile over here will be my main working pile of white. And what I'll do is I'll add 20% of my painting medium to that pile. And that white will generally find its way into every mixture that I'm using on any given painting. And so it's a really nice, easy way to get an even distribution of your painting medium throughout your painting. So in the painting medium that I'm using is over here. This is an, an Italian beeswax medium that's made by Old Masters Company. It's a traditional painting medium. Uh, the reason I use it is it helps the brush strokes, the ridges in the brush strokes stand up so there's no leveling to the brushwork and it also accelerates drying to a little bit and leaves the painting with an even uh, satiny sheen across it so I'm not getting a lot of hot spots and dull spots as an oil painting dries so there you have all my colors and then here's my tools I have uh, Basically, my workhorse brushes are these brushes that are manufactured by Rosemary and Company, which is an English company. This is uh, the Ivory Series Long Flat. It's a synthetic hog bristle. And I'll just tell you a quick story. When I was, I was at a, a plein air painting event a few years ago up in Pennsylvania, and the representative from Rosemary came up and offered me a few brushes to try. And uh, she said, they're synthetic hog bristle. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, I'm a purist. I don't want those synthetic things. I'm, you know, I use real stuff, you know. And so I, I graciously accepted them and I stuck them in my bag and forgot about them. And then a few months later, four or five, maybe six months later, I was at another plein air painting event and I wanted a nice, fresh, clean brush and I started poking around in my bag looking for what I had and I came across those rosemary brushes that I stashed months earlier. And I said, oh, I'll just give it a try, you know. So I tried one of them and I was instantly hooked. They're just such a great feeling brush. They're um, very beautiful. They hold and then release paint wonderfully. And they shape to a very fine chiseled edge when you load them with paint. And you can take a big brush like this and make some really nice fine marks. So I'm just hooked on these rosemary brushes. They're, you know, they're not the only brush I use, but they're definitely my workhorse brush. Then uh, this is my painting knife. Um, I'm not using this for mixing colors on the palette. I usually mix with the brush, but I do use this for making a variety of marks on the painting. So um, it could be applying paint to the canvas. It could be taking paint off the canvas. It could just be making different marks and sculpting the paint a little bit with it. It's also a great way to put some really fine lines on the canvas, such as uh, doing the rigging for a sailboat or something like that. Then I have a few other um, different tools here. This is just a, a, a hardware store paintbrush, and I use this as a knockdown brush, which is, you know, sometimes at the end of the day, you're, d you're done working, you might have some areas that are not completely resolved. You don't want them to dry with a lot of thick paint, so I'll just knock them down with a, a sweeping stroke or like that. And it sets me up for work the next day. Then I have this little rubber thing. This is a firm 
rubber. It's called uh, a color shaper. This little thing is, it takes paint off the canvas really well. Um, it's very useful, especially when you're working on um, architectural subject matter. Then I have this funky thing. This is called a catalyst. It's made by Princeton, and it's sort of a spatula-like thing with these comb teeth on the end. And I'll use this for breaking a line, um, making some abstract-looking marks in a painting. Um, it's just, um, I don't use it for every painting, but it's just a neat way to add some interest to, to the paint quality that you're working with. And then this is a fairly new toy for me. I got this at Home Depot. It's called a knockdown knife. It's in the drywall, from the drywall industry. I think they also use it in plaster in Paris. And it's just a knife, it's a sort of this, um, spatula thingy um, that has a foam rubber edge to it in the back and this is really cool for the way it uh, softens edges and um, makes interesting different marks on on the canvas so um, it's a new toy I'm really learning what it can do right now and um, hopefully I'll find a, a way to use it in the demo and we'll see what it does in the demo then uh, two more quick things I have my razor here which is just I use this for cleaning in the palette, whether the palette's wet or dry, that'll take the paint right off the palette, no trouble. And then I have this cup of oil that I keep in the corner of the canvas that has this uh, spring apparatus here on the top. And what I'll do at the end of the day, I mentioned I'm not really big on cleaning brushes, especially if I've been working hard all day, and I know that I'm going to get up in the morning and attack that same painting again. I'll just wipe the paint out of the brushes I was using, and I will suspend the uh, brushes in the in that spring with their hairs down in the oil and um, that keeps them pliable and fresh and ready to go for the next morning okay so there's um, my palette my color and my tools and let's go ahead and get started I want to uh, stop and pause for just a couple of minutes one thing I think I forgot to mention in terms of uh, materials is what I typically paint on. This is a, a linen panel, so it's, it's a linen mounted on a cardboard panel. These are made by Centurion. It's a Creative Mark product, so the, the, the parent company is Creative Mark. They're oil primed, and they're really a budget-friendly uh, panel that has a really nice oil primed linen surface to paint on. It's not the only surface I use, um, but I use it quite a lot. It's really, especially for plein air painting, they're lightweight, you can uh, carry them easy. And that way you're not always burning up 100 bucks for a, a canvas. Um, so what I like to do is pause for a moment and answer any questions. Anna, and then yes. Deborah, you're next. Uh, yes, I have a question about the rosemary brushes because yeah. I've taken the, uh, a plain air class with you before right. and I went online to try to order. Um, are they from England? They are from England. Yes, it was it was not easy um, and I it, 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 to navigate and I didn't know if they were offered locally or not. So the only place that I know of in the United States that, and that is uh, selling them is in Texas, and that company is called Wind River Arts, W-I-N-D, Wind River Arts. Okay. And if you Google Wind River Arts, you'll come up with it, and they have an extensive product line, um, and you can buy the brushes there, and they're actually selling them for the exact same price that Rosemary sells them over in England. Okay. Um, okay. So I would go Thank there, you. and uh, you'll be talking to Mary Rawls. Her and her husband Chuck own that company, and um, I would just buy them from them. So. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. You bet. All right, Deborah. Hi there. Uh, I had a very difficult time logging on, and now that I'm, and then I got bumped off. Sorry. So, well, there is this being recorded? That I yes, it is. Oh. Thank so, and the reason we had you register is so that um, we could get that recording to you. Okay, wonderful. So, all right. Thank you very much. You bet. 
All right, Mary Bunting had a question and I'm trying to unmute her. Can you hear me? I can now, go. <laughs> right, hi, hi Robert. Hey. Um, I was uh, wondering about your medium again, if I did not hear what you were using and I question or I wondered why you've chosen that as your medium of choice. So it's been, um, and that's a great question. I don't know that you can see this too very well. It's all uh, flattened up. I just ordered some new stuff because this tube's almost empty and it's probably pretty hard to read. This is called Italian Wax Medium and it's by a company called Old Masters. So um, you can just Google the words Old Masters um, and that should come up for you. The reason I settled on this, and it's just been a long process of trying mediums and working with them for a while and then finding something lacking about them and um, eventually settling on this medium. Um, the reason I like it is it does three basic things that I, maybe four basic things that I really appreciate. Number one, it adds a, some fluidity to the paint. So I'll add it to my white paint, 20% to 80% white paint. And then that paint finds its way into every mixture as I work on a painting. And um, so it adds some fluidity. So if the paint's getting sticky, I can add a little bit more to whatever mixture I have too to get the paint to flow a little bit better. Number two, I like to see the ridges in my brushwork. I don't, I don't want to come back to a painting the next day and all my brushwork looks flat and, and has leveled out. I, I like to see some of that little bit of impasto in my work. The beeswax aspect of this makes the brush strokes stand up pretty well. And so it just adds that level of impasto that I really like in my work. It also accelerates drying time. So usually I'll, the, the painting is dry to the touch, even though I'm using traditional oils, the painting is dry to the touch overnight. And then the other thing it does is it will leave a fairly even satiny sheen across the painting. Um, various different mediums that I've tried and oil painters have probably all experienced this is sometimes when a painting dries, you have shiny spots and dull spots, and it can be very frustrating to get it to, to have an even uh, finish, you know, and you don't want to send a painting off to a gallery or a show and then they hang it and it's got a glare, you can't even see it. So this medium helps even out the sheen across the painting. So those are the reasons I, I like that stuff. Great answer, thank you. All right, you're welcome, thank you. I have actually two. Number one, I, was I supposed to register for all three of these sessions? I think, um, I think it's, re, it's a repeating session, so I think you're registered for, for all three just by virtue of, of registering for the first one. So I scheduled it as a repeating or recurring event. So I don't think you have to register again. Okay. So if I can't make next week, will I then get this on um, sent to me by video so I could watch it? Yeah, so it'll be recorded and um, be able to watch it at your leisure before the next session. So sure. All right. And then could you just tell me the name of that little brush device that it looks it looked like a small paintbrush and it had a white rubber edge. Uh, um, yeah, that's called a color shaper. Color shaper. And um, it's out of reach right now, but um, okay, no, email then, me and, and and you can this is also being recorded, so you could go back and watch that little section of that video too. So how will we get those recordings? Um, they'll be emailed to you. So okay. that uh, there'll be a link emailed to everyone to access the recording. It'll, it'll probably take me a day or two to get that to you, but I will. That's great. Okay, thank you. All right, great to see you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right, Amy. 
Yeah, so I usually paint with acrylics, and I'm one, and, look, and I use Liquitex paint, and I'm just wondering what color would be comparable to that Provence that Windsor the Provence. Provence bluish. Um, yeah. I don't know if they would have like a cobalt purple, something okay. like that. Um, dioxazin purple. Yeah, maybe. I think yeah. Just think of it this way: um, it's a secondary color that is some type of a purple. And okay. it's not a totally dark purple. It's, it's a little bit lighter than the ultramarine blue and the, you know, so I'm thinking of it as a medium value and a purplish color and you'll find something that fits that slot. Okay. So I really do think of my um, palette as slots. You know, it's, um, there's primaries and secondaries, and I can interchange different colors there to do the same job if I want to. That just slows down the learning process, though, because you're always learning new colors. Yeah, I want to, just one other thing. Do you do these classes a lot? Well, I do a lot of in-person teaching, especially around the state of Florida, and I've even taught all the way up to uh, workshops up in Long Island and up in Massachusetts and um, various places up and down the eastern seaboard. Um, some of the circumstances this year has led me to try to figure out how to do online things. So there will be some, uh, some different online study courses starting up in August. So some of them will be live and some of them will be um, recordings that you can go to at your leisure and watch. So That's great. if you want to make sure you're kept abreast of any of those things, if you can go to my website, robertjsimone.com, there's a newsletter that you can sign up for. And signing up for that newsletter will ensure that you'll get notified anytime there's something new, a new painting, new classes, new opportunities, those kinds of things. So thank you. Joyce, are I you with us? <clears throat> yes, I am. I think I'm unmuted now. You are. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you, Robert? Wonderful. Um, my question was, after you were talking about your Italian wax medium, then you do not varnish at the end of a painting? Most of the time, it's not necessary. Okay. Every once in a while, I look at one and I go, you know, I think those colors could be just a little bit richer, a little bit more beautiful if, um, if I varnish it. So it's, but the, the thing about this medium is, as you know, I mean, we know each other because I was doing the plein air event there in Finger Lakes for several years. Uh, when you're painting in a plein air event, you don't always have the opportunity to varnish and so forth. Okay. So I was constantly in search for a medium that I could do a painting, I could hang it without varnishing it and feel confident that it still looked good a year later in that collector's house. So that was part of the reason. And this medium works really well. So at least it's an even sheen. If the, if the colors sink a little bit, at least they sink together. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. And, and I have an issue with my white not drying forever. It takes forever for the white to dry. So you said mm -hmm. that this one accelerates the drying time. So that would also be a plus. Yeah. What kind of white are you using? Oh, I think it's the titanium white. It's gambling. Huh. That's interesting. I, it just I takes forever. <laughs> I don't know why that would be. Um, maybe try a titanium zinc white next time you order paint. Okay. Um, it, the zinc will... Um, soften the paint a little bit, but I think zinc dries a little faster than titanium. So that I'm always using a tube of titanium zinc. And it took a while to okay. settle on that, but I like that a lot better than what I was using in the past. So. Okay, thanks. All right. Great to hear your voice. And now we have Nancy. Let me figure out how to unmute Nancy. Are you unmuted, Nancy? Where did you go? Okay, I, am, I unmuted myself. So, okay, um, thank you. <laughs> I'm in trouble with that. I didn't know I could do that. But anyway, I, I 
um, I'm really intrigued with the old master's beeswax. Um, one of my teachers uh, just influenced me to, to buy some cold wax medium from Gamblin. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's very matte, but um, I haven't really mastered it. But have, have you played around with different kinds of beeswax? It's definitely a beeswax product. And I just kind of wondered where you, what your journey was to choosing yours. Well, so it's just a matter of I've just been experimenting, and every time I'd order paint, I'd order some small quantity of a medium to try until finally I, I found this one and settled on it. Awesome. Thank you. You bet. Okay, so it looks like we're through all the um, questions. I'm going to share screen on two, two videos. Hello everybody, Robert J. Simone here and welcome to this virtual workshop on painting waves and water. Throughout the course of the workshop, I'm going to be demonstrating for you some of the particulars involved in the handling of that subject such as the anatomy of a wave, different color mixtures that you're going to find helpful, and even some brush work and different techniques for applying the paint to the canvas that I think you're going to find interesting. But before I dive into my demo, I want to mention that what I really teach is a painting process. It's one that's rooted in the idea that every painting should move from the very general towards the specific. And this is a process that evolved for me over the years and was inspired by a well-known Russian painter named Sergei Bongart. Bongart immigrated to the United States in 1948. He lived and worked in several locations out west before he finally passed in 1985. But what he did was leave behind a tremendous legacy of knowledge and insight that still inspires and forms many painters working today. Um, this process basically consists of three stages, the block in, development, and the finish. And each session of this virtual workshop is going to cover one of those stages. And you know, this process, once you understand it, and it's not all that difficult, you're always going to know where you are in a painting and what you should be doing. And that's a real confidence builder. And you know, confidence is really very, very vital to painting well. And so anyway, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on the demo. What I'm doing right now is I'm just marking out the thirds, roughly the thirds on each length of the canvas. And um, then I'm going to put a spot at those intersection points. And so what I really end up with is just an implied grid. And the, this grid is something that I'm, I'm going to use to just guide the placement of my major shapes. And mainly it just helps me avoid plunking something right in the middle of the painting, which is usually never a very good thing. Um, and then I'm just going to dive right into blocking in, um, mixing colors on the fly with my brush here and uh, just going to try to, in these initial statements, I'm going to keep the paint completely transparent. Um, that will become, the reasons for that will become evident later. And there's really just basically uh, a couple of points to the block in. The main point of the block in is to establish your design or your composition in very simple terms. Um, and part two of that, the second half of your objective is to cover the white of the canvas as quickly as possible. And the reason for that is that white of the canvas 
it really will sir it masks the truth of uh, of your color harmony so the best way to get rolling is to just cover the canvas as quickly as possible in general color now um, A couple things to note here is that I am not doing any sort of linear drawing whatsoever and um, that is because I'm just trying to stay simple. As I mentioned, um, the point of this block in is to establish your main idea, your main composition in its simple terms. Um, and cover the white of the canvas as quickly as possible. And if I start pulling out a little, I don't know, let me see if I can find a little brush here. If, if I were to pull out a little brush and start drawing right now, that's going to suck me into detailed information. And um, that's exactly what I'm trying to avoid. So we just scrubbing in in completely transparent paint. This is a mixture of ultramarine and Prussian blue and Viridian and I also um, put in a little bit of burnt sienna just to knock it down, uh, knock down the saturation level of it. Now I'm going to uh, switch brushes because I'm gonna mass in something for my sky there and that's uh, it's not as critical to stay completely transparent so I'm going to use a little white in this mixture and um, so I'm switching brushes so I'll always have a brush right here that has no white paint in it whatsoever um, at least for now and um, let's just see uh, how this little how this uh, color looks for the sky. Um, the sky is lighter than the water. Not by a whole lot, but it is. And I'm shooting for that relationship in general terms. That's the beauty of this way of starting a painting is nothing has to be exact and you nothing has to be perfect you're just shooting for general statements of color and value and big silhouetted shapes um, there's time for refinement later It's a little bit sticky so I'm adding a little touch of medium to it even though I do have medium in my white I just felt like I need a little more predominantly vertical strokes in the sky because the sky sort of arcs down from its apex above our heads down to the horizon and we're effectively standing inside of a dome. If you're standing inside of a dome, say over a Tropicana field, the lower portion of that dome is really more vertical than it is horizontal. Again, no, no reason to, to strive for perfection. These, are, these passages are initial estimates, first estimates, and so you're just, like I said, general color, general value. These are first estimates. There'll be plenty of time for refinement later. The number one objective at this time is really just to oh, get that white of the canvas covered as quickly as possible.
also paying a little bit of attention as to what direction my light is coming from. So in this scene, my light is coming from the upper right. So it's hitting the side of this mass of, of uh, foam right there. And it's also hitting the top. So I can um, just get in there and start refining shapes just a little bit. This isn't detail, but um, it just kind of gets the ball rolling towards uh, a more foamy looking finish. It's also given me a chance to adjust the values. As I look at the reference, I see the, the big area out in front of the main wave. We call that the foam blanket. And there are holes in the foam there where you can see um, sort of a gray color and it's not totally identifiable to me but I'm mixing some grays out of a couple of complementary colors such as ultramarine blue and burnt sienna and also viridian and alizarin crimson those make really nice uh, grays and I'm just like I said, making a first estimate for some of these grays out here. And I just take great comfort in the fact that I don't have to get this perfect at the moment. Ballparking it. So this is really, this is coming out into the horizontal plane right here. And so it does take on some of the influence of the color of the sky. It's also a shallower part. This wave is breaking pretty close to shore. And so this is a shallow area where a lot of sand has kicked up into that thin layer of water. And so that's why it's got sort of these gray, brown, sort of unidentifiable colors in it. There is going to be a buildup of strokes indicating foam and foam trails and a pattern of foam out here in the foreground. So all I really want to do at this point is um, cover the white of the canvas and um, give myself something to build on later. I'm not going to go pure white. I uh, would never paint pure white into a painting that is, um, there really is no pure white in nature anyway. And so when you use pure white straight out of the tube to try to reach those high notes where the lightest light hits, you're, you're essentially using a, what's a cold color usually to depict a warm passage because white is the coldest color on your palette.
there is a lot of motion in this area out front here and ultimately that's going to be suggested with some brush strokes and I'll explain a little bit about that but I also want to use some is getting ahead of myself I'm going to use some patterns in this foam to sort of direct your eye right to that central focal point of the wave got uh, some of that lighter color a little closer than I needed to to the main wave so just bringing in an intermediate value there uh, and at this moment I'm asking myself you know how's how am I doing as far as the general color harmony um, what about the quality of light that I see in my reference is that's something I did like about this reference it's with a sky as dark as it is that really makes this relationship right here in the central area of the painting um, really come forward it, it emphasizes the contrast and values there where if I had a real high key light blue sky I might not get that same level of uh, strength in that area of the painting so um, just sort of evaluating with my best judgment there's really no right or wrong I, like I said um, these are all first estimates just really trying to cover the canvas as quickly as possible in very simple general terms not getting into any rendering at this point one thing that I want to just re-emphasize is this idea of keeping some purely transparent paint in the main part of this wave now what do I mean by purely transparent well that's paint that has no opaque colors no white no no other of my opaque colors in it right now um, that's going to help me achieve a real watery uh, look to the painting as I further develop it and that's something that's really not necessarily particular to every painting every subject it's it's very advantageous to getting this jewel like quality of a nice ocean wave in the beginning you can see that it, that is just pure transparent and it's allowing the canvas to show through in other words the light hits the canvas it's able to penetrate that passage of transparent paint and it bounces back to the viewer in a way that gives like I said the, that uh, July quality um, but I do think ultimately that is probably darker than what I'm ever going to need there for this painting so I'm just going to now oh I see something I missed
part of the wave here that's called the tube. Okay, so that's basically, that's a block in right there. It's the initial covering of the, of the white of the canvas. Um, general colors all first estimates. The more I work like this, the better I get at getting a pretty good first estimate. Um, and it's also just getting the, the main shapes down on the canvas where they go. Now, notice there was never really any drawing involved in that. It was just all massing in big areas of value. Sometimes what I do at this point to refine some of those shapes a little bit, I'll go in with a little darker color and do a little drawing. Just to clarify and emphasize some of these shapes. is really probably all I need at this point. All right, so there we have a block in that was done in all of 21 minutes. So um, it's not a stage of the painting where you want to labor and sweat over fine detail or any kind of specifics. You're, you're just looking at this point to, like I said, cover the canvas, the white of the canvas as quickly as possible. The reason for that is the white of the canvas actually masks the true color harmonies that you're trying to establish. And you're also trying to establish that initial impression um, that's created by the value structure and you're, you're just trying to place your main elements on the canvas in uh, places that suit your design aesthetic and, and that's it. You, you don't have to do anything more. There's uh, there's a block in. I think it'd be a good time. We've got about 15 minutes or so left in the class, and so I want to entertain any questions that y'all may have. So please um, raise your hand if there's something you're wondering about. Um, Amy. I want to ask you about the gray. You said it was on um, ultramarine and um, the burnt sienna and viridian and the alizarin orange? Uh, alizarin crimson. So those are my two go-to complementary colors. If you really um, think about it, the best way to mix grays is with complementary colors. You could also yeah. use white plus black and then add a little color to it to, to nuance it. I find that for the type of subject matter that I'm frequently painting, um, mixtures of ultramarine plus burnt sienna with a little white added to it if I need it, um, those make wonderful grains. Also, viridian plus alizarin crimson makes a wonderful gray. I mean, in, in my mind, alizarin and viridian are just 
so close to the same color, only on the opposite side of the wheel. They're, they're very similar in value. They have the same level of saturation as each other. One's green, one's red, and anytime you mix those complements, you wonder, you come up with some wonderful grays. And if you, when you mix it, if you, um, if you make that mixture, you can have it lean a little towards the alizarin and be a more purpley gray, or you can have it lean a little towards the green and be a greener gray. Same thing with the ultramarine plus the burnt sienna. You can lean that mixture of gray one way or the other and get a lot of wonderful nuance. Let's go up to Joyce. Robert, what is your thought process? How do you determine where to put the horizon? The way I decide where to place it is, I number one, I ask myself, do I want this painting to be more about the water or more about the sky? So if I want a painting to be more about the water, that horizon line is going to be above the halfway point on the canvas. So just like this one back here, it's way up towards the top. Okay, um, if I want to have more sky, maybe there's beautiful clouds in the sky and I really want to emphasize a beautiful sunset, something like that, I'll move that horizon line down below the halfway point so that I have more sky than I do water. I'm uh, yes, you are. I don't know why I'm having trouble with that control. I'll figure it out by next week. Well, it's not really a question, but you know, it's interesting because you look at a picture and you didn't draw the picture. You looked at the value of the light and the dark. You need to block in. And I had, a, I had one teacher one time, I said, well, I can't draw. She goes, well, if you can't draw, you can't paint. That is not true. <laughs> I, had, I had a teacher who, she blocked in just like you did for a still life, but she used raw umber and light and dark measures of raw umber you know, yep. to, to block in the picture. More of a gray and, sky. I've... Yes, yes. And I love your method in, you know, it, you, you find values, you color values that are more like your picture, but it's not, it's not the paint exactly, you know, you don't have to have the paint exactly, but have the values, the darks and the lights, and block the white in. Yes. The, 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 the panel in. So and and that, let me just mention something about that. That comes directly from some painting notes from Sergei Bongart. In the middle, in the beginning, I mentioned um, a guy that inspired the way this process evolved for me was Sergei Bongart. And one of the things that Sergei always said was, um, if you can mute you for a second, because I'm getting a little reverb, and then you can unmute Anna. Can you mute yourself for a moment? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. Um, so, Bongart said, um, understand the basis of composing a picture in color. No color should be viewed in isolation, but rather in constant relation to what is around it. A color is what it appears to be only because its relationship to the surrounding colors. Nothing exists in isolation. Each previous color choice must be reevaluated as a new color is placed alongside it. If you change one color, you have an effect to change them all. When we paint, you really aren't copying the colors of nature. We are painting the color relationships. You know, think about it. We're, I'm using, I think, 13 colors on a palette. I can't copy the colors in nature if I wanted to. I'm very limited relative to the photons and whatever goes into making colors appear for, for real. So all I can really do is paint relationships. This one's lighter, this one's darker, this one's warmer, this one's cooler, this one's redder, this one's bluer, all those different relationships. So, um, and that's exactly what Bongart says when we paint. We don't have the color palette that nature has, so we must give the illusion of truth through the relationships of the colors we choose. In my mind, it's, and I've all, I've done plenty of paintings the same way you were talking about where you, you I use a grisaille or sort of a monochrome start. 
that monochrome start, so it will help you arrange your um, painting, but it won't do anything to establish your color harmony. So as long as you're massing in big shapes, why not mass them in in full color? And when you're done covering the canvas, you have your, your composition and your color established. If you're just doing a grisaille, you've got this brown grisaille, and now you have to colorize. So that's just what evolved for me. I'm not saying it's bad to do it the other way. I know some people who um, do that to great effect. Um, it's just the way I, my work has evolved and, and what my interest is, is, is getting some really interesting and truthful color relations that's going on and get them going right out of the bat. So, all right. Let's see. I'm having a little trouble with my cursor here, so. All right, so Anna is gonna mute you. Mary Bunting. Oops, Mary, are you with us? Can you hear me? Now I can. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, at two quick questions. Um, with the block in, did you um, thin your paint at all or was it straight tube uh, paint for your... Um, so uh, I'm basically working straight. Great question. I'm basically working the paint straight, straight out of the tube. Okay. Um, I do, at one point, I felt the paint was getting a little bit kind of sticky and not spreading. So I added a little bit of my painting medium to it. Okay. I've learned over the years, it took a long time to figure this out, but I learned not to really use solvent in the painting process. It used to be I would lubricate the paint by dipping the brush and swishing it around in my, my mineral spirits. Um, but when you think about it, what does solvent do? It dissolves and breaks down the paint. So that practice was undermining my ability to get some nice juicy texture in my paint. It, and so I stopped doing that. Um, and you can, I, and so I started moving to different brands of paint that weren't quite as sticky. Short answer, no solvent. I added a little bit of medium when I needed to, but mostly it's just done straight out of the tube. Can I ask you one more quick question yeah, while I have you? Yeah. It has to do with um, shadow and light in your paintings. And I recently studied with somebody that had mentioned that um, the anything that is under the arc of the blue sky is going to have a cooler light to it. And then things that would be more in a shadow would be uh, a little, like in nook areas, would be a little warmer. Does that hold true with waves or, or not? Well, the principles of light behave across um, any subject matter, whether it's a wave or um, a barn, what have you, if you have bright sunlight hitting something, that sunlight is a warm color, so you have warm light, cool shadows. Then you'll have these little um, dark marks I call dark accents that are, or they're technically called occlusion shadows. Um, and it, this is something that I'm gonna, uh, really highlight in a future video that's going to come out in August, but uh, those uh, little darkest darks get warm and dark again. So if, if whatever the area of the painting is, is receiving predominantly illumination from the sky above, it's going to take on some of the coloration and influence of the colors of the sky above. If it's if the dominant light source for that little given part of a, a wave is the sun, then it's going to take on the, the color and values relative to the sun. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You bet. And then next week we're going to um, dive into really the meat and potatoes of the painting, which is the development part of the process. That's really where most of the painting happens and I think where most of the teachable moments are. So um, 
Anyway, look forward to the recording coming to you, and then you'll be able to grab that reference and do a block in. I can't wait to see what y'all produce. All right? Wonderful. Thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. I, I thank you, Robert, for, for your time, and um, look forward for Robert to, um, teaching classes in person at our WADA campus in the future, as well as we, we do have them for the next two weeks, which is exciting. Um, if anyone did not include their, um, their name and email address, and if they are a water member or not in the chat, please do that now. Um, when you do become a member of, of WADA, uh, you gain access to a wide variety of benefits. Uh, you have free access to education classes, such as this one. Uh, you get a member profile on the WADA website. Every week, our WADA Community Digest features an artist member and or a business member. And um, anyone can get on our WADA Community Digest, that it, which um, you can sign up for that on our website. Um, lots of good information there. Uh, and also um, you can exhibit at, at a WADA member show, which we actually have one coming up here shortly. And uh, apply. you can apply for studio space at the Arts Exchange and the adjacent um, plaza that we have. A um, few last things, you can rent a classroom at the, at the Arts Exchange. Uh, you're joining artists from around the community and access to our WADA member network Facebook page for all the latest and the greatest, which is uh, we have lots of calls to artists um, throughout the area that get thrown on there and um, lots of good information. So, and if anyone has any questions about WADA, uh, please feel free to um, email me. I do, I will put my email address in the bottom or in our chat here. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. So thank yeah, you for joining us.